What's up, Meta Nerds? In part one, we saw the rise and fall of Kaiman Jai Shalal, a Kalish warrior with intense honor and connection to the gods, only to suffer a series of devastating losses, starting with his lover Kumar, then his elite generals, and finally almost his entire body. Going on to live as a cyborg, his hatred for the Jedi was magnified and manipulated to make him a weapon for the CIS. Being the most feared individual throughout the Republic for the use of planetary bombardments and bioweapons. Something that drove both sides to call for peace talks, only to be scuttled by Grievous by orchestrating the bombing of the Senate District Reactor. This was followed by the CIS attempting to take the mid-rim world of Naboo. With the outer rim almost completely under control, Naboo could provide a crucial staging area that would help push to the core. Dooku had convinced Gungan Minister Rish Lu to use a mind control amulet to bring Boss Leone under his control. With this device, they were able to get him to declare war on their human neighbors, and he began rallying his troops to take Theed. But Skywalker could sense the power of this odd necklace, and when the boss snaps out of it, he goes to confront the traitorous minister. But Rish Lu was given a contingent of commando droids, who leaped down and were able to keep the Jedi occupied. And in this fight, the boss was stabbed, while the traitor escaped. Luckily, Boss Leone survived, but he was unconscious. Padme and Anakin noticed that Jar Jar had an uncanny similarity to the boss, and they try and use this to learn more of the Separatist plot. Upon Grievous' landed C-9979, the General asks why the boss has suddenly changed his mind. Jar Jar tells General Tarples to contact Padme, and the Senator tells him that he must use this opportunity to capture the elusive Grievous. When he finally gets tired of waiting for the Gungan General to return, Grievous storms out to find Tarples standing with his Gungan troops saying that the droid army was deactivated. But the cyborg is unimpressed, ignites his two lightsabers, and parries the Gungan's stun pike while moving to engage Tarples, eventually working through his defense and spearing the enemy general with the weapon of his own people. How does it feel to die? Not die. Sacrifice! <laughs> Tarples knew he could not outfight the four-armed, saber-spinning cyborg, but he could use Grievous' lust for murder to trap him. After being impaled by the spear, it was followed up by a volley of Boombas that short-circuited his cyborg body. The greatest warlord in the galaxy was captured by the Gungans. Dooku was hiding out in Rishalu's secret lab when he was contacted by Darth Sidious, who was already aware of the General's capture. General Grievous is a critical part of my plan for the Clone Wars. He must not remain captive. The Count would instruct Lu to lead Skywalker here, and Dooku would finally capture the Chosen One by using an overwhelming force of specialized Magna Guards. Sidious' knowledge of the romance between the Jedi and Senator would prove invaluable, as this bond would be exploited to free Grievous from his Ion Bubble restraints. The Republic and Jedi Order left in complete shock that they would have to let the number two most wanted individual in the galaxy just walk right out of custody. The General would follow this up with a successful capture of Adigalia after an intense space battle and boarding of her Venator. Hoping to put her through the Eathcoth torture video treatment, he brings her to the bridge when his flagship discovers a pirate vessel that he felt should be cleared from this sector. But luckily for Adigalia, Plo Koon's fleet was able to discover the location of the Providence, and at the sight of five Venators opening fire, Grievous knew he had to abandon ship. In the next weeks, Darth Sidious would test Dooku's loyalty by having him betray his favorite assassin, Ventress. Sidious feared her growing power, the pair that Dooku and her would make, and in an instant, her life would forever change. This brought incredible joy to Grievous, who always had to keep an eye on her rise, the Force user that would insult him, and who had a different connection with Dooku due to their Force abilities and shared falling from the Jedi Order, a connection that always made Grievous worried that he would be the one to be betrayed. But after the attempt to kill the assassin, she returned to Dooku's palace with the Night Sister Witches. This is the closest Dooku had come to death for a long time. And for this, the entire coven of witches on Dathomir had to be burnt to ash. And Grievous was more than happy to carry this out. Wipe the witches out. All of them. Their illusions do not frighten me. Yes, master! A full planetary invasion with thousands of droids and dozens of tanks would all be transported via several of the massive C-9979 landing craft. Bombers would eliminate the witches outside of their main temple, followed by ranks of droids that pushed through the dark forests. As they pressed closer to the coven, Grievous ordered the defoliator tanks to make their approach. Night Sister Magic would unleash an army of undead, but the high-tech weaponry was consuming their sacred woods, burning away the trees that contained the bodies of their long-dead sisters. 
Ventress used her knowledge of CIS vehicles and weaponry to command an AAT and take out a nearby defoliator, as she led her undead troops to Grievous' command ship. When the general came down the ramp to meet her, both tell their forces to stand down. Ventress then offers to settle this invasion with a one-on-one -on -one duel, hoping to play on his sense of martial virtue. Then fight me alone. Prove you're the greater warrior. The dual red blades of a Sith crashed against the blue and green of the stolen blades of the Jedi, and Grievous was able to dominate this force wielder for some time. But eventually her skills found the weakness in his guard. Grievous is knocked to the ground, and as Ventress raised her sabers, he would be forced to choose between trying to maintain the honor of a Kalish warrior, or to survive. But his warrior virtue had died off along with his old flesh. Before the blades could come down, he ordered his troops to fire. The B2's powerful blasters requiring her immediate attention to evade and deflect. While the undead army springs to Ventress's defense, an endless barrage of bodies hurling themselves at the cyborg, requiring all of his limbs and savers to keep them from bringing him down. In this insane battle of droids versus zombies, Grievous gets a hollow transmission from his master. You must stop Mother Delzin before she kills me! On these orders, he leads his troop in to rush the Night Sister Temple. Following the trail of Green Icor to their coven, Grievous is unfazed by the swarms of arrow-firing witches that made up the last line of defense. He stormed through the ancient structure, stabbing any witches he came across, and when he finds the head shaman Daka, who is performing a magic ritual, he stomps right up to her and executes the old witch, immediately freeing his master. In what now seems like another lifetime, Kaiman Jai Shalal would have sought guidance and revered shamans like this old woman, the Night Sisters in many ways being similar to the Kalish. Upon her death, the reanimated sisters were back in their slumber, and with these undead reinforcements, the witches were no match for the overwhelming numbers of high-tech force. Grievous would then strike at Mother Talzin as a volley of blaster bolts came from commando droids, but her connection to the dark magics transformed her into a fading green mist. Ventress would be the only known survivor at this time. Falling from hopes of becoming the second most powerful person in the galaxy, she had been beaten by an army of mindless droids, led by that monstrous cyborg, weeping as her clan mother appeared to her in the form of a spirit, to tell her that she must leave Dathomir. Sometime later we see that with Ventress out of the picture, Grievous was not worried about her temporary pawn and fellow Dathomirian Savage Opress. But Dooku was concerned about this rogue element that was on the loose without a clan of Night Sisters to contain him. <laughs> you consider him a threat? He is a threat to all of us. And though Grievous would not have a run-in with Savage, he was far from done with his dealing with Dathomirians. But for now, his attention would be turned to his nemesis, Obi-Wan Kenobi. When they received intel that his fleet would be near Florum, Grievous used his enormous fleet to ambush them, swarming with multiple Munificence and Providence class, delivering hundreds of droid fighters. This cuts off Kenobi's attempt to send Cody to rescue Ahsoka, who had just been kidnapped by Hondo Onaka's pirate gang. This overwhelming force was able to provide cover for Grievous to board Kenobi's flagship, the Negotiator. With squadrons of HMP droid gunships and vulture droids combining to provide overwhelming fire within the Venator's main hangar, Grievous became a whirlwind of death, utilizing each limb to slash and crush the troopers before him, using their deaths to try and strike fear into the heart of the Jedi. You'll regret that. And despite the human's rage, he was still just a slave to the limits of an organic body. Grievous was able to saber lock and then kick Kenobi into an LAAT gunship. Cody's quick thinking has Obi-Wan force push a fuel tank into the cyborg as the clone fired. But the effect was only to provide Grievous with some singed armor and a chuckle. The Jedi would flee, and triumphantly he would take the bridge of Kenobi's flagship. A momentous prize in the war between these two, but the Jedi were always full of tricks. Congratulations. However, if you're watching this message, that means I'm boarding an escape pod and shall soon be safely away from the ship, which is about to self-destruct. The General would be forced to sprint back to his shuttle, barely making it away from the Venator as it was blowing to pieces in a tremendous explosion. After this mostly successful ambush, Grievous moved to his task of capturing the Outer Rim world of Florum. With this massive fleet and thousands of droids, Grievous confidently strolls into the Pirate King's throne room climbs onto his table, and grabs the weak way by the throat. But this planet is now under separatist you... control! And what do you suppose that means? It means you have a new master, Pirate Scum! Informing the pirate that he will now bow to Count Dooku. And Dooku then explains over Hollow that the entire pirate army was now property of the CIS. 
As Grievous was directing the droid's salvage and scrapping efforts, he would get word that the Jedi had snuck into the compound. Ahsoka had been able to convince the pirates that their interests were now aligned, and after she rescued Hondo, the group hopped on speeders and tried to make it through the droid horde. Grievous pursues in a CIS combat speeder, and after a lengthy chase through a cavernous region, Hondo is able to lose them and get to his secret hangar, which contains Slave One. Grievous had leapt onto the craft of the Soka and the Padawans, and when they crash, the dust clears to reveal that the cyborg was still with them. Walking up and seeing this group of children, Grievous laughs at how easily it will be to kill them. <laughs> so many lightsabers to add to my collection! When Hondo flies up in Slave 1, Ahsoka tries to hold off the general, but his arsenal and expertise is just too great. His defense is impenetrable, and he uses his command of his metal body to grab her face and then backflip into smashing her skull against the ground. Ahsoka had improved exponentially since they first met, but still not enough. She would have to run away, and Hondo tries to get revenge, nearly blowing him to bits with Slave 1, before an AAT appears and opens fire. The general was saved, and although he could not collect any lightsabers in this series of attacks, he had taken out Kenobi's flagship and secured a valuable new sector for the CIS, while also neutering the pirate that had once captured Count Dooku. In the following weeks, Grievous would be planning the strike on the Valor space station in the Corida system, an attack which required the use of a captured Venator, packed full of Rhydonium, and sent on a collision course with this station, while it was hosting a Republic strategy conference which involved the top military brass and Jedi High Council members. The Republic had intercepted a message that might have given them a warning about this, but it used a new encryption method. This prompted the deployment of the droid-filled infiltration team, D-Squad, to try and retrieve it a mission that ultimately stopped the attack just seconds before the Venator could strike its target. If this would have been successful, Grievous would have helped to bring about the death of his nemesis, including most of the High Council and Republic military leaders. Losses that would have almost certainly forced the Republic to sue for peace on CIS terms. As Darth Sidious was secretly drawing the Clone Wars to an end, he was also ensuring that the chaos of this war was providing him with the means to rule his inevitable empire. Grievous was tasked with securing an enormous kyber crystal which had come into the possession of Sugi arm dealers. This was the same sort of crystal that powered lightsabers, but at this size it could power a battle station sized weapon. Grievous would secure the deal on the planet Utapau, but Skywalker and Kenobi had discovered the existence of this crystal while investigating the death of Jedi Master Tu An. By the time arms dealer and Dante meets with Grievous, he had already received intel from his droids that the Jedi had secured the kyber. Do you think I'm an idiot? You don't have the crystal, but there's no reason to steal it. For trying to lie about losing it, Grievous decapitates him in front of the local Amani bodyguards. The general would take to a combat speeder to catch up with the fleeing Jedi, his IG-100s leaping to the platform to engage Kenobi. Together, his saber skills and Skywalker's piloting would scrap the droids, though eventually they would be overwhelmed and let the crystal fall into the hands of the Separatists. Droids would shuttle it to atmosphere, through an enormous CIS fleet, and into the hangar of a supply ship, all while the Jedi were pursuing the shuttle, with Grievous trailing in his fighter. Skywalker sets their ship on a collision course with the CIS supply ship's hyperdrive, while they take escape pods to the hangar. But the Jedi are split up and land in separate hangar bays. Grievous pursues Kenobi, and while the Jedi takes out the battle droids with ease, vultures would loom over him while droidicas blocked his exit. And after more than two years, Grievous was finally successful in beating his nemesis, locking the sabers and using his free hand to grab the human by the throat, choking him before throwing him to the ground. Spinning sabers in each arm, he stares into the Jedi's eyes, as Obi-Wan expects this cyborg's face to be the last thing he sees. Grievous is excited to have the opportunity to torture the Jedi that threatened his place at Dooku's side and insulted his reputation as the galaxy's greatest warrior. But the festivities were brought to a halt by none other than Anakin Skywalker. He rescues Kenobi, and together they would rush the crystal out of the hangar bay, where the Jedi jump from tank to tank, locking all the AAT's targeting computers to fire on the crystal. This overpowers the force-connected material, and charges of energy are released in massive bolts that fire off in each direction one of them nearly striking the general. He can tell this will eventually explode and take the entire ship with it, so he races to his fighter and is able to pursue the Jedi shuttle down the length of the hangar. Perhaps he'd be able to shoot them down if the kyber crystal did not result in such a large chain reaction that damaged the soulless one and sent it tumbling through space. 
This would be followed by the successful conquest of Utapau, and just days later, Grievous would act as bodyguard for his master during an enormous ceremony on the Separatist capital world of Raxus Secundus, where Dooku was receiving the Raxian Humanitarian Award. This event would see an assassination attempt on Dooku by his old apprentice, Ventress, who was working with Quinlan Voss to take out their shared enemy in the head of the CIS. Grievous was able to help thwart the attack from this Night Sister, while the next mission would involve hunting down a rogue Knight brother. While Savage was killed on Mandalore, Maul had been taken prisoner, only to be freed by his Mandalorian super commandos. Darth Sidious tasked Dooku with using his resources to find the Zabrak, and Grievous was given the coordinates of old Death Watch outposts. Maul was eventually tracked to Xanbar, and Darth Sidious gave Dooku strict orders that Maul's forces were to be broken, but he must not die. Though Grievous did not understand why, he was ordered to use his entire fleet in this operation. Arriving over Xanbar, he would send several transports to the surface, and though the anti-aircraft guns took many of them out, their numbers did allow them to break through. From the bridge of his flagship, we see just how much respect he had for the people who he considered to be the greatest warriors in the history of the galaxy, saying to his tactical droid, quote, We are not fighting clones this time. These are Mandalorian warriors. Send in everything we have, and let us hope that will be enough. As the fighting raged on, Grievous spotted Maul on the battlefront, and swooped in on his transport, of course sending his Magna Guards in first. They surrounded the fallen apprentice, though with his force powers, dark saber, and unlimited rage, the Zabrak was able to slice through each of them. One of Maul's super commandos was calling Grievous and his forces cowards, which drew the cyborg to close in on him and quickly impale the Mandalorian with a pair of blades. Maul would come leaping at the general, when with their sabers locked, Grievous tried to break his spirit, pointing out that nearly all of his super commandos were killed by the unending wave of droids. Maul's last move was his gauntlet fighter's bombing run. But he knew Grievous was right, that his only option was to flee. Victorious, the general hails Count Dooku, explaining the losses on both sides, and guessing his master's true purpose was to draw out Mother Talzin. Dooku confirms his suspicion, but says he will soon understand Maul's connection to the Witch. Over the next few days, Maul would rally his remaining forces on Ord Mantell, and when the Separatist spy droids reported that a craft had left Dathomir, Dooku meets up with Grievous and readies the fleet for another major battle saying they will ambush them on Ord Mantell, and if the clan mother was there, Dooku would be the one to face her. The instant the CIS fleet comes out of hyperspace, they conduct an orbital bombardment, reducing most of the city to rubble before they sent in the landing crafts. Grievous commands from the bridge, while Dooku heads down to the surface with a group of Magna Guards to hunt down the Dathomirians. As the T-Series updates him, Grievous notes that things were too quiet, not enough starfighter resistance, and just then, laser cannons start blasting at the bridge. Maul knew to avoid the rest of the fleet and just focus on capturing the general. His Maul Delorean forces would board the flagship, carve through with the Darksaber, and storm the bridge. Maul force pushing the droids to scrap before tackling the cyborg into the Transparasteel. In a split second, Grievous had one of the most coveted Jedi blades in the galaxy pressed up against his neck. Maul gives him the ultimatum to shut off the droids or get beheaded. And always ensuring that he can fight another day, he complies, and all the droid units on world went limp. A decision that could have gotten Dooku killed, as Shadow Collective forces were now free to aid the Knight Brothers that were battling Dooku. With this overwhelming force, the Count was captured alive, instead of being filled with blaster bolts. Once he gets word of this, Maul communes with the spirit of the Mother, telling her that he has both of Sidious's pawns, that they could use this to get the revenge on the Sith Master. Grievous and Dooku were in their restraints and brought to their knees, while Maul hailed his old master. Sidious tried to seem unfazed, but Maul gets him to show that he was worried about losing the leader of the CIS and its top general, which would remove much of his power to manipulate the war from both sides. When he cuts off the transmission, Maul is dismissive of Grievous, seeing him as a forceless monstrosity, but he is interested in speaking with Dooku alone. Grievous is well aware that a Sith's allegiances are never to be fully trusted, and warns Dooku against betraying him, saying, quote, it would be unfortunate if next time we meet, Count, I had to add your lightsaber to my collection. While Dooku was making it seem like he was going along with Maul's plot to turn on Sidious, he secretly unlocked the door to the brig. Grievous erupted out and smashed the guards' armor through their skulls. And though he knew this break must have been the Count's work, he immediately scrambles for the nearest escape pod, ripping several super commandos to shreds on the way to salvation. If he would have stayed here, he could have helped the Sith face off against General Kenobi, as a Republic strike team had intercepted communications and caught up with Maul's forces, having been tracking them since Obi-Wan's time on Mandalore. 
In the resulting battle, Master Tipley would die to Count Dooku's blade, and a volley of Mando rockets gave the Sith a chance to escape. Maul would take his remaining captive to Dathomir and summon the spirit of Mother Talzin, a storm of green Ikor energy taking over the chamber. Meanwhile, in orbit, Grievous was alone with Sidious, something that had not happened throughout the course of the war. Dooku had always been the intermediary, and the General must have thought that this mission would bring him even closer to the true ruler of the galaxy, securing his role in the future state of the galaxy that Dooku had only alluded to. They were aboard the Scimitar, Maul's old personal ship that had one of the best stealth suites ever produced. Activating their cloaking tech, they would descend to the Witch's Coven, where Dooku was currently being possessed by the Night Mother Spirit. As the ritual was underway, a wall explodes and Grievous and Sidious step forward. After some insults are traded and Dooku regains consciousness, he stands up with green ichor flowing out of his eyes. Talzin's spirit would rush towards Sidious, hoping to get revenge on the Sith that had betrayed her decades earlier, while Grievous worked on earning himself the Darksaber. But as they fought, they couldn't stop from being drawn to the awe of the battle beside them, the two most powerful wielders of different dark arts fighting to the death. When it looked like Force Lightning was overwhelming the puppet body, Talzin is able to complete the life-draining ritual and physically reanimate. In orbit, a Separatist fleet had just arrived, and Maul was able to deliver a powerful force push that sent Grievous flying out of the chamber. Ikor and force powers clashed, and Maul adds his powers to his mother, while Dooku recovers to contribute his own bolts of lightning. The fate of the galaxy would be decided here, and Grievous sees his chance. It's times like these that prove to Grievous that concepts like a warrior's honor, glory of a fair fight, were the weak-minded delusions of the flesh, and he was happy to be rid of them both. As he walked up to the mother, she knew this battle was lost, and used her final burst of strength to push her son back into the arms of the super commandos who had just arrived, fleeing from the fleet in orbit. Exhausted, she collapses before the cyborg. Grievous' only words were a cold, it's time, before he puts a pair of sabers through her chest. With Grievous' help, Sidious had finally tied up this loose end, this one threat out there that could challenge his mastery of the supernatural energies. With the Night Sister Order defeated, the only other threat to Darth Sidious was the Jedi Order. We are now only days away from the close of the Clone Wars, and Grievous found himself on the trail of Master Deepa Balaba, tracking her from Harun Kal to Kardoa, and finally Megiddo. After intense fighting on the platforms that crisscrossed the cities, the General would pounce on the Master and her Padawan Caleb Doom. While his Kage warrior engaged the Padawan, Grievous was attempting to overpower and strike fear into the Jedi, but to no avail. Despite the barrage of blades, she just stayed calm, and eventually was able to find an opening, and with a quick slash she severs two of the cyborg's arms. But Grievous counters with a strike that glances her back. The Padawan, who would later go by the name Kanan Jarrus, was able to defeat his opponent, and sees his wounded master trying to hold her ground. He rushes in, and luckily a pair of clones arrive and start blasting. Grievous feels that with more reinforcements inbound, and in need of two repaired limbs, he would have to leave without a new pair of sabers. From here, Grievous would oversee the invasion of Kashyyyk, delivering massive amounts of land vehicles and HMP gunships into the thick jungles, planning on activating them all at once in a surprise attack on the Wookiees. But he would be recalled from this Outer Rim world to carry out the most important piece of the war, the assault on Coruscant itself, and the kidnapping of the Chancellor. Important parts of Sidious' plan to become an absolute ruler, using the chaos and fear caused by this attack on the home of the politicians and the wealthiest in the Republic, to scare them into calling for a strong dictator to secure peace. Before the plan would be put into motion, Dooku gave his general one final saber lesson, using on the odd state of their relationship, respecting the cyborg's commitment and tenacity while knowing this being's true origins that he was tricked into thinking this life was his own choosing, when Dooku knew that it was he and the Mune allies that had made this incredible Jedi-killing weapon that was standing before him. Blowing up his shuttle, killing all his men, depriving him of his revenge on his true enemy, the Huck, while using the Force to manipulate his mind and think the Jedi were behind the attack. An attack that didn't even destroy his body at all. It was their decision to discard the Kalish in favor of robotics. They had forged this weapon to their liking, but if the story Grievous believed about himself was false, he did have cause for legitimate hatred for the Jedi, and Dooku reminds him that this hatred is his greatest weapon. Remember what I taught you, General. If you are to succeed in combat against the best of the Jedi, you must have fear, surprise, and intimidation on your side. For if any one element is lacking, it would be best for you to retreat. 
With that, the largest Separatist fleet ever deployed would use secret hyperspace lanes provided by Darth Sidious to launch directly at the capital of the Republic. Upper levels would see clouds of starfighters, plazas covered in droid tanks, and landing craft dropping off thousands of droids. There were countless, redundant warning systems in place, similar to the Rishi Moon Station protecting the hyperlanes to Kamino, so the Jedi were taken completely by surprise. They would pour out of the temple, with Mace Windu soaring through the city in his Delta VII. There were so many Separatist starfighters that he wasn't even shot down, just barraged by the solid stream of fighters that raced through the skyscrapers. While overhead, the entire orbit of Coruscant was filled with capital ships. To the Chancellor, this was a lovely view to take in. Shock T led a group of Jedi to move the Chancellor to a more secure location, but Grievous would smash through the window. Before he could grab Palpatine by the neck, Shock T force pulled him into her arms and the Jedi made their escape, hoping the clone troopers and Senate guards would be able to keep the cyborg occupied. But this did not slow him for long. A flurry of sabers and metal claws would lead to all of their deaths in just a few seconds. He would then have to chase them through the halls, down the elevator shaft, and outside into the Senate Plaza, where thousands of droids were in place to cut them off. The Jedi knew that failing in this moment could mean a quick Separatist victory, so with incredible force powers they were able to keep the droids back, but even this only slowed Grievous. The Jedi team again had to flee, being pursued by Magna Guards the entire way, eventually leading to a shuttle, which Grievous would disable, and then down into a mag train station, where the intense saber training with the IG-100s was proving successful. Grievous caught up with the Jedi, but they took advantage of one aspect of the general that was not built for pure combat efficiency but a relic of his once deep connection with the spiritual side of a warrior. Shakti would use the force to tie his Kalish cloak to a nearby train, and when it took off, it dragged him along and brought him some time to get Palpatine onto a transport. But she knew the Magna Guards were still on their trail. The fight would be lengthy and intense, with the Togruta taking a severed Electro Staff to help her keep up, though right when they seemed like they had eventually defeated her, they mysteriously back off, and the Jedi knew this must mean that Grievous had captured his target. The General had engaged the other members of the Jedi Strike Team, and with their sabers blocked above their head, the Cyborg's second pair of arms came out to slay them. And turning his attention to the Chancellor, we see that Grievous was not aware of the public identity of Darth Sidious. You wouldn't dare harm the Supreme Chancellor of the Republic. Whatever would your masters say? You are lucky they want you alive. Shakti catches up to them but is exhausted from the fighting throughout the Senate Plaza, into the city, through the train station, and then with a horde of the best melee trained droids in the galaxy. When she rushes at Grievous, he calmly parries her blade and grabs her by the throat, taking her saber and wrapping her in electro cords to torture her. Palpatine would be rushed to an awaiting Separatist shuttle, but Mace Windu would try to intercept, using the force to crush Grievous' torso and being powerful enough to bend the Duranium armor, his vital organs within the synth sack, especially damaging his lungs, compounding the issues that were present since the transition to his cyborg body, when the lungs never fully integrated correctly. Then enter Kenobi. Upon getting word of the invasion of Coruscant, they would race across the galaxy and drop into space battle, making their way to Grievous' flagship, the Invisible Hand. The fight would see the death of the Count, shocking news to Grievous, who had been under his thumb since even before the war broke out always keeping him just one step away from being the true leader of the Separatists. To make this promotion even better, he was able to trap the Republic scum in a ray shield before they could escape. With the Jedi put in restraints, he could have had them both executed, but the rapid succession of victories over these longtime enemies was too exhilarating to cut short. He gloats, but Anakin is sure to get a jab in at the Cyborg, whom he had heard so much about from his Padawan and Master, but never actually faced himself. General Grievous. You're shorter than I expected. And though he didn't plan on fighting them just now, more likely to keep them and have them tortured, he would help himself to two of the most elusive trophies in the galaxy. Your lightsabers will make a fine addition to my collection. But just then, that pesky droid that Grievous had once captured for intel was going haywire. And this distraction allowed these Jedi to use their unfair advantage known as the Force to pull their blades into their hands and free themselves. Grievous knows that there was no winning this fight between the two greatest swordsmen in the Order, and he hopes the Magna Guards could hold them back. But when these droids are sliced to scrap, the General doesn't even try to fight. Instead of beating them with saber skills, he would exploit the weaknesses of their organic bodies, hurling an Electro Staff through the Transparasteel and sucking himself into space. The humans would desperately hold on while the emergency bridge protection activated, while Grievous scaled the exterior of the Providence to find an escape pod. With Dooku dead, 
He was the sole leader of the CIS, and he was fine with losing the hostage chancellor. Confident the war had hit critical mass, and Republic defeat was just moments away. After some hours, Palpatine was safely back in his office, and Grievous had received word from the true master Darth Sidious, officially making Grievous the leader of the CIS, and telling him that he was to convene with the other Separatist founding members to explain their next move. Arriving on Utapal via Sheathapede shuttle, he embraces this long-awaited moment. He was truly head of the largest military force in the galaxy, the greatest of warlords, and was now able to lord over even the Mune bankers and sniveling Viceroy Newt Gunray. Triumphantly, he would give Darth Sidious his instructions, for what promised to be the final moments of this three-year-long war. I am sending you to the Mustafar system in the Outer Rim. But the incompetent Imordian tested Grievous' new authority, only to be quickly put in his place. Without Count Dooku, I have doubts about your ability to keep us safe. Be thankful, Viceroy. You have not found yourself in my grave. With the CIS representatives dismissed, the general turned to gather his troops, when the Jedi nemesis reappeared. Hello there. General Kenobi! <laughs> You are a bold one. Grievous calmly steps back to allow his IG-100s to soften him up. When the Force wielder uses tricks, the General calls his troops off and says he will slay the Jedi himself. I've been trained in your Jedi arts by Count Dooku. But using his greatest weapon of fear was a bit harder with that crush from Mace Windu. <laughs> Struggling to breathe as he prepares for combat. He would open with the intimidating spinning blade move that had earned him so many trophies over this war. But the expert swordsman was able to use a single blade to find the perfect spot to penetrate, stopping the helicopter spins and using a combination of acrobatics and accuracy to evade the whirlwind of blades, as the human tried to honor all of the Jedi slain by this monster. With complete focus, Kenobi would slice off one hand, survive the flurry of the cyborg-powered blows long enough to find another opening, and bring Grievous down to just two hands. The general was enraged, but as they face off for another flurry, clone troopers were heard shouting in the distance. The Battle of Utapau had begun, and clone troopers were pouring in from every direction. Droid starfighters would rush to try and intercept the LAAT gunships while battle droids were blasting into the Republic invaders. Despite losing two hands, Grievous was still trying to intimidate the Jedi. You must realize you are doomed. Grievous' lack of force abilities left him open to a powerful push that sent him crashing into the machinery above, causing him to lose his lightsabers and fall down to the level below. Landing on all fours, he scurries away like a bug to his smooth six wheel bike. This blow compounding the damage of the one delivered by Mace Windu. He would race out of the building and down into the tunnel system below, intent on living to fight another day. Kenobi was quick to pursue on a boga, but though he lost his sabers, Grievous had an electro staff stored in his bike. As the Jedi scum and his organic mount neared, he struck at them with the paralyzing weapon. But again, the precision and focus of this human was unmatched. Dodging the thrusts, Kenobi was able to grab the staff, avoid the tendrils of electricity at the head, eventually ripping it out of the cyborg's grasp, proceeding to beat the main wheel of the bike before landing a blow to Grievous's face. With this hit, the general was able to regain the weapon by pulling Kenobi onto the bike with him. They struggle over the staff while the vehicle was trying to stay on course. And with Kenobi focused on the melee weapon, Grievous reached for a hidden E5 blaster rifle. He nearly gets a shot into the Jedi, but Obi-Wan is able to force the staff down to launch them both off the vehicle, tumbling across the landing pad. The bike flying off the edge, the Jedi doesn't miss a beat, grabbing the staff and rushing to finish the fight. Grievous takes a shot with the blaster, but it gets knocked out of his hand. Knowing the cyborg's weak spot, the Jedi delivers a stiff blow to his chest, followed by a block strike, but then gets a powerful hit that sends the cyborg to the ground. After years of narrow escapes, his nemesis is intent on seeing this come to a close, delivering another perfect strike to his chest, trying to get at that synth sack of organs. But even without a weapon, his duranium robotic body was a weapon of its own, and he delivers a powerful kick that knocks the human several feet into the air into a painful landing. Grievous closes the gap and denies Kenobi a chance at the staff, proves the superiority of metal over flesh. The human making futile attempts at hand-to-hand -hand combat, before Grievous delivers another blow that sends Kenobi smashing into the Soulless One. The General was now confident that this long series of saber duels would now end with him brutally beating the Jedi to death. 
but this human used his agility to evade, call on all of his strength to force open the cyborg's chest plate. At the sight of his organs exposed, Grievous goes into a panic that fuels a series of blows that nearly knock Obi-Wan unconscious. And hoping to stomp the human, he laughs as Kenobi again shows the greater strength of the cyborg body. He was sure victory was seconds away, laughing as he threw the meat bag over the edge. The Jedi was pathetically holding on for dear life, and Grievous reveled in the moment. Picking up the Electro Staff, he calmly walked over to end the greatest Jedi General. With one blow, the Jedi would fall unconscious to his death, but Kenobi stayed focused on Grievous' only two weaknesses. Calling on the Force, he would bring a blaster to his hands, and with a single shot, he would burn a hole through his organs, a blast that sent the liquid of the Synthsack ablaze. <laughs> and the Jedi kept firing away at his weak spot, until all that remained of his once great Kalish warrior body was consumed by the flames of his own hell. The greatest warlord in the galaxy was killed by a man that was one of, if not the best, at using his connection to the supernatural to aid him in his role as a warrior. A fitting nemesis to the dream warrior once backed by shamans fighting for reverence of the Kalish gods. And when he became a completely physical being, powered not by a warrior spirit, but by high-tech materials, mechanics, and weaponry, he was doomed to be defeated by one with a strong connection to the Force. You can only hope that the Kalish gods found a way to forgive him, knowing that this path was one that Kaiman Jai Shalal had not chosen for himself, but rather one imposed on him by the Sith. What makes this end even more tragic for Grievous is that he would die just minutes before Order 66 was given, after a lifetime dedicated to killing Jedi, to seeing the temple consumed in flames, driven to rid the galaxy of the Jedi Order, he was denied seeing this ultimate victory. When Kenobi returned to Cody, only to be betrayed during Order 66, he would make his way back to the platform, pass Grievous' corpse, and take Solus One to flee Utapau. This is the ship he would use to rendezvous on the Tantive IV, and when the infamous general's body was discovered by clone troopers, it was deemed top secret and placed in one of Palpatine's hidden storehouses on Utapau. Though he was dead, his legacy would continue to shape the galaxy. The Empire created two cyborg military units based off of him, the Terror Trooper and Terror Biodroids. With the design most obvious in the faceplate, but even in the name, Terror being the general's greatest weapon. Other researchers would be inspired to create four-armed, saber-wielding cyborgs like the Mon Calamari Carbon. And later, the Empire would task cyberneticist Nikolai Kingsworth to turn the body of the old general into a deadly new droid. No longer a cyborg, the Kalish parts gone, he was completely a droid, but he would have been happy to know that he was no B-1 battle droid. His body was animated by the most advanced droid combat brain of the time, and around 1 ABY, he would come online fighting with a double-bladed lightsaber, which was powered by the kyber crystal that once belonged to Darth Bane, which would have been the greatest piece in his collection. They even crafted NK-3 guards based on the IG-100. But despite these advantages, this droid reincarnation was destroyed by a band of raiding spacers. Sometime after this, the spacers must have sold off the face that struck terror into the hearts of countless billions of Republic citizens, with it selling for an enormous amount of credits on the invisible market. Being purchased by none other than the ultimate student of military history and art, Grand Admiral Thrawn. The Chiss warrior respecting the tragic tale of this tortured soul, and being aware that he was still a heroic figure on his homeworld. Should also be noted that Mr. Bones contained some of Grievous's computer code for controlling his body. In circa 25 ABY, New Republic era anthropologists discovered that Kaiman Jai Shalal, a man taught in the NR's textbooks to be one of the most vile, terroristic generals of the Confederacy, was now being revered by his people as a god. The Dreamer and Dreamt One had displayed such a martial virtue that they were certain that the gods had welcomed him into their pantheon. The spirit of Shalal would speak to all warriors who lived with righteous anger, and we can only wonder if his powers in the afterlife gave him the ability to finally find his lost soulmate to give Kumar the peace that the gods denied her all those decades ago. If his people were right, that Shalal had become a god, a force to guide his people from the afterlife, then perhaps the experience he had in the Jedi Temple, and what he saw as living proof in Kenobi, showed him that so much was lost when he was put into that cyborg prison. Perhaps in the final moment of his life, he realized that he had been manipulated by offworlders, 
taken away from his own people to fight in their foreign war. In that final moment, the fire burning away all of the alterations on his brain, allowing him to awaken to the reality that he still was the Dream Dreamer. But that's the end of the complete life of General Grievous. Thanks for watching, that was a wild ride. I'm happy with how it turned out. If you guys liked it, please hit that like button and subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. Also be sure to comment whatever it was you did like or some things you were confused about or what you think could have been done better. I really do read all the comments, so all that helps. I think Grievous' story is one of the most tragic, detailed, and uh, important for the future of humanity and our uh, slow crawl towards cyborgness. Making all of this, I'm definitely wondering if we're ever going to get a Grievous show, a Grievous movie. Who knows? Let me know if you guys think that's a good idea or not. Um, oh, and our shirts. Yeah, straight out of 1313. We got a ton of new shirts out. Uh, so be sure to check out all that stuff um, down in the description. Tons of other ways to help support the channel. Affiliate links, things like disc plate, solid metal prints. Audible for free audiobooks, not just Star Wars books, but anything you're interested in. And of course our Patreon and PayPal. Special shout out to our supporters over on Patreon, especially our $25 tier. Chris Garcia, Cass Costello, C7Go, Matthew Beltrami, Seraph Diaz, and Bill Payne. But most important of all, remember, one man's warlord is another man's god. And the force will be with you, always.